Welcome to the Northern Ethology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, owner of the company Horns of Odin. And today I am joined by food historian Beth Rogers. So welcome, Beth. Hi, hi. So glad to be here. Yeah, before we start, I do have a, a brand new microphone, which was paid for by our lovely patrons. Um, it took me some setting up, which is why I was late. But <laughs> so if, I guess if I do sound different to everybody, because I assume I will do a little bit. Somebody said I didn't sound as deep. So yeah, that's why. That's why I may sound a little bit odd. And hopefully I'm going to sound like this going forward, I guess. Mm-hmm. That's the plan. <laughs> you sexy man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Well, this is the <laughs> this is the test. You're, you're the test. You're the test subject for the new microphone. I'm so lucky. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was all... You know, I, I tested the microphone this morning. I tested the the little preamp thing that I bought and it was all working fine. And then I plugged my old webcam in and it decided it didn't want to work. Because, of course. <laughs> of course. So then I had to restart my laptop and mess about. So I do apologize for being late, but we're here. Yay, we made it. <laughs> yeah, and when uh, when I had a little look at who we had on this week and I looked at your your social medias um, <gasps> from some yeah. some from some of your posts i was like we're gonna have fun <laughs> this is, you're gonna be a fun guest i could i could just tell and by some of the the lovely names you give your papers oh yes <laughs> utter calamity <laughs> <But> yeah. No. <laughs> yeah so you're very creative with the names with the oh, names yeah. of those so can you can you just tell everybody a little bit who you are what you do your background your education okay well we do all sorts because i'm one of those who rolled up late to academia um i was first a journalist and no one told me that print was dying okay <laughs> so i arrived with my degree just in time for the wake oh, and, no. then, <laughs> and then you know journalism very changed very different especially where i come from in, in america very difficult field um, so then I faffed around a bit and I took an internet quiz that told me I should be a teacher. And I said, obviously not. Mm, <laughs> but yeah. then I thought, no, nah, I don't have anything else to do. So let's give it a go. <laughs> I'm very game. I'm that person. So I, um, did a master's in teaching as well. I fell in love with it. So I'm all about education and teaching and talking to people. Love it. And then I made it all the way to grad school because by then I had met my husband, who is Icelandic, and I thought, well, the university has this program that they teach in English, so, you know, maybe I can learn a little something about culture, mythology, read some books. By this point, I was also teaching very small children um, in a local school here, so, you know, I wanted to have conversations with adults Mm-hmm. Yeah. about real things i missed it <laughs> i mean i sometimes do have the intellect of a child so it may be a throwback to uh to those days that's okay you know what? i can work with that <laughs> she's got lots of experience okay good so yes um and i just remember like especially here in icelandic schools there's lots of handicrafts and there's lots of um tactile sort of things that are missing from a lot of programs where I come from so you know one day I was I don't know how to sew but I was teaching the class how to sew having learned in about five minutes so I could then turn around and teach them and I just thought like what is my life what am I doing this is (laughs) so this opportunity came along to do this program Viking and Medieval Norse Studies which is the same one that Bob Van Strien came through which is why he thought of me and along the way, I I took a bit longer to do my degree because I'm a local and I and I wasn't in a hurry. Um, so I was just doing a lot of different things. And uh, then this food history class came along and I was literally like, my God, I had never thought about this this way. I have to know everything about this. And of course, I was like leaping out of closets and around corners at the professor, like, tell me more. And he would be like, oh, and... <laughs> Eventually, we became great friends, and he became a, a very good mentor for me. Um, but that was basically the beginning of it all, just just going along and, and picking up things as I went and realizing, you know, what fascinated me and reconnecting with that part of myself that's, you know, very intellectual, likes to talk about 
big concepts in the world and what connects us all, mm-hmm. uh, which are a lot of things. But for me, the one that fascinates me most is food. So here mm-hmm. I am. <laughs> yeah, I guess food is a, a key part of all human history. We we can't survive without it. So it it, it, jo- it certainly joins us together. That's what I love about it the most is the conversations that you can have because everybody has an opinion about food. Probably the most fun I've ever had at a conference almost erupted into a fist fight because there was a bunch of people uh, in the room. And of course, as you may be able to guess, the majority of, you know, hardcore food historians come from France and Italy because those are the countries that had the Mm. most, you know, luxurious resources and they could faff around with their food for ages and ages while the rest of us on the outskirts were just trying to survive let me um, guess it was it an argument of a pe- pineapple and pizza it was not although that is another one that is a yeah. hot topic. Don't that seems worry. to be that seems to be the one <laughs> yes and don't get it twisted absolutely but um it was about uh, it was a French person presenting, lovely professor presenting about the importance of of sharing a meal and what these kinds of things mean because uh, that's what food history is. It's not just uh, what we eat; it's it's why we eat, when we eat, where we eat, how we eat it, how we make it, why it matters. All of these things wrapped up into one. A lot of people think that I just study recipe books or cookbooks all day, but that's not quite it. <laughs> okay, it's a whole it's a whole world of ideas that surround what goes into those cookbooks and why. Um, but yes, yeah, so we were in uh, this lovely presentation where the French professor was just so passionate about his topic. And then he got to the question period and somebody asked, well, yeah, but nowadays you can just replace all that with Soylent. I don't know. This was a few years ago. It was very popular back then. Soylent, this uh, meal replacement that you just drink. It's sort of a, uh, you know, bland tasting beige milkshake. I I feel like we had something similar, but it wasn't called Soylent. Right. I've forgotten what it was called. I was uh... the latest cool yeah, like Huel, when somebody says, Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy knows, <laughs> is one of those kinds of things. And and this whole debate just erupted because the the traditionalists were just offended that you could just, you know, yeet all of that, you know, culture and amazing, uh, you know, things that surround the food and just sit at your desk and eat Huel or, or Soylent or some meal replacement mm-hmm. and think it's it's fine. It's the same. And I remember I came up to give him a compliment afterwards, like, oh, I really enjoyed your talk. And I just said, oh, sir, you know, I have, I have a little question for you. And he goes, do you like Soylent? <laughs> I said, I do not. <laughs> so then he let me ask the question. Oh, dear. <laughs> it was it was unfortunate, but you should have seen the faces. I mean, just <laughs> suck the air out of the room. I mean, people are really excited about this. <laughs> And you can just, you can get all kinds of opinions because everybody thinks about food, at least a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And I think there, there is two camps. There are people like me and I assume like you who love food, love the taste of food. We like that culture around it. We eat not only for survival, but because it tastes good and oh, yeah. gives us very good memories and releases endorphins you know there's there's so many things that go along with it but you also get a, a camp of people who they just eat to survive they have no enjoyment in food they or at least very little they're not that <laughs> they're not that interested in it they kind of it's like very meh they'll just eat when i have to and i mean yeah absolutely but and and that's an interesting field of study as well like i have a lot of a lot of sassy students who like to point out that in the past and it is true in the past in the pre-modern and you know medieval period we didn't eat a lot of meat we were very vegetarian so to speak but you wouldn't call you wouldn't call yourself a vegetarian because vegetarianism is a is an entire sort of ethos and philosophy about you know being thoughtful about what you eat and not harming animals not taking animal meat and then of course veganism is on the other you know even further not any animal products at all it's this entire modern sort of movement um so it's more than just what you eat or don't eat it's the entire way of thinking about what you eat that's missing if we use the word vegetarian or vegan when we're talking about the past even though it is true that you know the the lower classes the not nobles uh didn't eat a lot of meat as a general rule 
Mm-hmm. Also depends on where and when you are, <laughs> as okay. always when we're talking about history. Um, but yeah, it's it's all those kinds of uh, fun things and ideas. So I spend a lot of time in my classes encouraging them to think beyond just, you know, finding a recipe. <laughs> yeah. You know, things like that. Okay. So we're, we're here to pre- predominantly talk about the Viking Age. Yes, indeed. And I guess my first question has to be, how much can we truly know about what they, I don't know if that's too big, maybe of a question to start with. And if you want to pinpoint a certain part, but it seems like with, with everything with, with the Vikings, particularly when it comes to the mythology and and so many other things, we don't actually know that much. We can speculate, we can try and figure out, we can guess, but the, the actual accuracies of definitive answers doesn't seem to be that often. Yes, and that is always the the trouble of of Scandinavian studies or medieval studies in general. You know, depending on where and when you're speaking of, you might only have a couple of documentary accounts. Archaeology is a little bit easier, but then of course, even they have their pitfalls. If you fall in love with textiles, then you know you're shit out of luck because textiles, for example, don't survive very well in the archaeological record. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're buried in the ground for a thousand years, there might not be very much left. <laughs> I imagine um, that's the same with food, though. Obviously, you're going to get absolutely. This is very true. So what I've done, for example, in my thesis, which, by the way, is about um, the cultural importance of skir and other dairy products in the medieval Icelandic culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, Skir is a type of it's actually a type of cheese, but it's soft. So we eat it like a yogurt with a spoon. Mm -hmm. Uh, it Lots seems to have got really popular in the UK the last few years. Yes, it, uh, we have one company, one massive company called Mjörkur Samsalan or MS Iceland uh, in English. Uh, and this is what they've chosen to be the cultural export, especially it's gotten really hot over the years with, you know, Greek yogurt and things like that. When people were looking for a healthier option than yogurts, which typically have lots of sugar in them. Um, it's also really high in protein because uh, the way it's made, it's like squished down. So it's very thick and all the way takes all the acid out of it and all this kind of stuff. I know lots of boring information about <laughs> yogurt biology but (laughs) that's a general idea it's very thick because of the way it's made it's very uh, low fat and very high protein which of course made it like a holy grail product in in the modern era when people were really excited about finding new healthier things to eat Mm -hmm. and so you've got companies like um sickies and that's i think in america and a couple other places there's MS, which exports around the world. They don't always export their uh, product because getting it from Iceland is a bit expensive. Uh, but mm-hmm. they would like export- the rest of Scandinavia. Indeed. Oh, yes. You know the story. Um, but uh, they do export their cultures. They do lease their culture to uh, mm-hmm. their, their little dairy culture, not like the culture of <laughs> okay. humans doing things. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And they will allow them to make the product from that. Let's see, there's Siggy's, there's uh, MS, there is uh, Arla, which is a Danish brand that's that's quite okay, popular. That, I think that's the biggest one over here. Okay, yeah. So there are quite a few, but uh, MS is really serious about saying like authentic Icelandic skir, you know, okay. and that's another huge debate in food history, uh, food studies, really, like authenticity. You know, the, um, a few years ago, there was a there was an article, I think, in Vanity Fair that was a recipe for pho, the Korean soup, which is really yummy and delicious. And it was, of course, made uh, by very highly regarded, but also very white uh, chef, which, of course, you know, made the, the Internet sort of explode with this idea of, you know, appropriation and things like this. How can mm-hmm. how can this person who isn't from this culture tell us what it means to make an authentic dish? And, and you know, just, <laughs> oh, yeah. just the soylent moment all over again, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it's important to have these discussions these days. And it's all part of it's all part of food studies and food history. What does it all mean? What does it add up to? Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's start with skier seeing as we're, we're there. Okay. Um, how, how authentic is it? 
how <laughs> how accurate to the Viking Age? <sighs> well, <laughs> actually, <laughs> I never get to do this, so I'm very excited. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. Um, the skier that we eat today is is going to be very different because mostly because they have to make it for the modern palate because otherwise you won't buy it. And okay. they make it and it's great, but no one buys it. Does it really matter? This is a tree folding in the woods kind of question for any food producer. So they do add, they do absolutely add sugar, which was non-existent really in Iceland, especially back in the day. Um, oh, Interesting fact for any of you listeners who are Scandinavian. Um, obviously, when I talk about skiir and I talk about its importance in Iceland, uh, it was definitely made in other places. We have a long tradition of skiir and uh, skiir-like products like the Germanic quark or the Norwegian uh, one that Jimmy just mentioned, I think, <laughs> and uh, things like this. Uh, but the reason that Iceland sort of holds it close to its bosom is because uh, Norway and the rest of the Scandinavian peninsula was much more connected literally and figuratively to Europe. And so much earlier, they started to have more options with their food. It was easier to get exports. It was easier to trade. Um, so they got to have a lot more variety, whereas Iceland depended on skier for survival for much, much longer. And uh, actually, that's part of my uh, my uh, thesis is to take a look at the period from 1000 to 1500, which, of course, makes any historians in the room go, because oh, the scope is ginormous. Mm -hmm. But one, food history always takes a huge scope because, to be honest, we only count two interesting um, uh, changes in human diet from the beginning of time to modern era. There's two major changes. If you can guess what they are, hmm, there's one, which is fire, the addition of fire to food. And okay. there's two, which is the shift from uh, herding and nomad nomadic lifestyles to agrarianism okay. or farming. Yeah. So yes, I, I spend quite a lot of time, you know, justifying my choices to a bunch of very serious traditional scholars of history who take a much smaller view. Um, so the large scope does help uh, because mm. then I can pull more things in as examples and I don't run into the problem that you're absolutely pointing out, absolutely true, that we only have a few sources. Um, Two, uh, it's also what I'm trying to show about dairy products with my research that's important. And that is that not only was it important for daily life, it was meaningful for the Icelanders, but what I'm showing is a step beyond because I always got to do a little extra. I'm so extra. <laughs> so what I'm showing is that if we didn't have skier here in medieval Iceland, we wouldn't have been able to survive and flourish and create what is known as the saga age, which is our beautiful creative period, which brought the world all of our lovely manuscripts and sagas. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. And was it, was it always a big been... swing here. We'll see if it works out. <laughs> <laughs> was it always made with cow's milk or... Um, nowadays, it's made with cow's milk because that's what modern pilots and people mm -hmm. prefer. Back then, it was more likely to be sheep's milk. That's that's what I was. Th I'm glad you said that because I was yeah. thinking. I mean, were there cows in Iceland? Absolutely, there were. There's there's a really clear progression, and this is what we get from archaeology. So we have real evidence here, not just people faffing around with writings that may or may not be fictional. Um, but what happened was the, the majority of the first settlers in Iceland came over about 890, and uh, they were mostly Norwegian, at least the majority of the men. We have new DNA evidence that says perhaps up to 60% of the settlers, women and men combined, are Celtic. So okay. we, um, how do you say, borrowed some people, <laughs> yeah. um, as they sometimes did. Um, yes, so these people came uh, to Iceland and they, in their minds, they thought, okay, this is our new land. We're going to make it prosperous and beautiful like the land we knew. And so in their minds, the proper way to have a farm was to have this big, beautiful area filled to the brim with a cattle. 
because cattle are big, they're high status, they take uh, more food than most other livestock. They take more careful, um, you know, keeping an eye on them, making sure they're milk, they're more dainty and delicate. They, they tend to fall um, ill more often than hardier livestock. And so the Icelanders said, fuck it, we are, we are making our new world and it's going to be great. So we're going to have cows, cows everywhere. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, they did not realize that Iceland is in a slightly different biome, a little bit further north than Norway is. So um, when they arrived, it was forested from coast to coast, according to both our great writing in uh, Landnama book, the Book of Settlements. Um, but also the archaeological records shows that that is true. Um, and then they cut the trees down. <laughs> they said, yeah. okay, we need land for our livestock. We need, we need wood for our buildings. We need all this fabulous stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Look at all this wood. <laughs> and then they sat there and went, uh, guys, the... The trees aren't. The trees aren't growing. Do you see that the trees aren't growing back? <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this became, <laughs> and then it became an issue of you know them beginning to understand what the land could support and what it couldn't. So within a few generations, those large high value farms full of cattle were only reserved for the most wealthy uh, yarls or you know landowners on the best land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, they did indeed need a load of us. Him is not, not wrong, but yes, it's very much that. So, and then they realized, okay, well, you know, maybe not all of us can have cattle because it's a hard, hard life, hard to do, hard to deal with here. What can we do instead? And then sheep came in and saved us. <laughs> so yeah. then there were sheep everywhere. And as you know, where are you from, Dan? Actually, I don't know. Me, I'm from Yorkshire in England. Yorkshire in England. Okay, so you know about the sheep. <laughs> you know they're, the importance of the sheep. They're hearty things. They are really hearty. Oh, animals. yes. And not only that, but around the same time in the middle of the Middle Ages or the High Middle Ages, this woolen cloth became a much uh, important mm -hmm. resource. Uh, you could use it for trade. So um, uh, it's called Vavmalk here in Icelandic. And so that became really important because that's another resource you, you could get from your sheep. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the on the lower end it are the goats, which are, you know, even hardier than the sheep. They give more milk yield uh, per animal than sheep do, actually. But they are they are sort of in a terms of a class system. They are a little bit more for the poor folk, uh, those who can't afford the sheep or, of course, the cattle. Would that what what would be the reason for that? Is it down to a quality of meat? Is it the lack of? Meat? Yes, absolutely. Like uh, it was just sort of understood by the early settlers, and in recreating this worldview that they had brought with them from their original homelands, whether that's Norway or Denmark or wherever. Um, <clears throat> um, yes. Hang on, I see your question, Kim. <laughs> uh, yes, they were bringing this worldview with them. And uh, absolutely, they organized everything from the, the cattle on down. And that's something you can see, for example, in the law, because the law of Iceland comes to us mainly from a book called Gragos, the, the Grey Goose is what it translates to. And uh, they measure the value of livestock against cattle so for example one specific type of sheep is worth uh, one cattle uh, if you have you know high value sheep then you know four sheep for every one cattle things like this i have to yeah. i'd have to look up this mm -hmm. <laughs> anecdote for you specifically but everything is metal, measured against the value of one cow and in fact the word so for a, a cow is the the top the top dog the the one yes. that everybody wants and the word for cattle is fear in Icelandic, and this is also the word for money. So that should also tell you something. <laughs> so is that why is that why you see is it the the rune fehu, which is often represented or people say is cattle or money? Yes, that is why. I didn't think about runic. I'm gonna have to add that in <laughs> to my analysis. Fabulous. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> that might be the that might be the first time I've done something like that on the podcast. Ooh. In over 130 episodes, I 
have passed on knowledge. Oh, yes. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> I do I'll expect credit, though. <laughs> <laughs> an excellent point but yes kim was saying she was asking aren't sheep and goats related and yes they are they are they are in a class called caprines uh both of them and so sometimes when you find bits of bones in archaeological sites it can be difficult to to tell if you're looking at a sheep or a goat uh so they just when they can't tell, when they can't identify it po positively, then they will just lump it all together and say, they're Caprian bones. <laughs> mm -hmm. See, so, baby, yes. baby Dan thought that goats were just male sheep and sheep were just female. <laughs> That's right. You were figuring out the world. You are putting it together <laughs> in I a way that made sense to you. <laughs> I, say, I say baby Dan. I wasn't that young. And I also did the same with tigers and lions. And I... <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to say this because I was about 16 when I realized this. <laughs> so I was too old that I thought that lion, the tigers were just female lions. And I don't know why I thought that. And I'd gone through all of high school. And for some reason, that was just, it must have been something that I picked up when I was little. Yeah. And nobody ever corrected me on it. Like nobody ever said that you're wrong. Or maybe I just never said it out loud and I just kept it to myself. And well, I mean, how through. often do we stand around and be like, so about tigers <laughs> i mean they look different and they live, they live in completely different places so i should have probably known better but <laughs> I, I i was too old to realize that they weren't the same <laughs> don't get there in our own time man it's gonna happen <laughs> i believe in us <laughs> i got there i did get there eventually <laughs> yes. okay so where were we um do we have an educated we, person here? Kim is saying a cat is a cat is a cat, which is a reference to some very French structuralism. Good Lord. <laughs> so yeah. is there, do you think there's anything else we need to know about goats and sheep? Goats and sheep. Or can we move, should we move on? <laughs> Wasn't expecting that one to get so specific. Um, let's see. Goats and sheep, I think we're good. <laughs> we're good on. Okay. So I, I want to know what like the typical diet would be, but I guess it would, again, depend on whether you're in main, so I'm with mainland Scandinavia, so like Norway, Sweden, Denmark, or in Iceland, or even, I guess, between, between Norway, Sweden, and Denmark is going to vary depending on your location. Obviously... Yeah. It would indeed, but I can the give time, you some broad strokes. I was going to say, I guess, in, in also the time period that, you know, the Viking Age is, what, 300 years? So it's going to depend on that as well. And yes. then wealth, I guess, is going to pay a big part as to whether you're just the average farmer or you're higher up. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, I can give you I can give you a general idea for all of sort of Northern Europe. Uh, but then, of course, my research focus is, uh, on Iceland. So Norse Iceland is where my heart lives. Uh, okay. So yeah, the, the general idea, and we have this from things like very early cookbooks, which come to us from places like Denmark, Kogabok. Uh, so do we have do we have cookbooks from that long ago? Very they're very late by the time they got put put together. So they're okay. from like for the the 1400s. Which is another reason this is what I mean when I say I have a very large scope so that I can take a look at all these things. Um, and then there's another one called the Beleste Arte Cocinaria, which is the um, the art of cookery. And it was written uh, in about 1200, I believe. But it's it's about the manuscript that we have remaining is from about 1200, I should say. But it's from a Germanic scholar who went to uh, King Clovis in the Germanic area very early. And he sort of cataloged what they were eating and, you know, how it was different from the way that this person was used to eating in the, you know, the Roman Empire kind of area. Uh, he was, of course, a clergy member. So he was used to eating a certain kind of diet. And mm. then when he went to uh, the Germanic areas and saw what they were eating. He was quite surprised. Um, a lot of meat, a lot of beer, which is not 
uh, what's typically eaten or drunk in the middle of the empire, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> Sounds like my kind of diet, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Essentially, it goes like this. Um, uh, in the middle in the Middle Ages, but it, uh, our ideas of food essentially still stem from the ancient world. We had guys who wrote extensively on things like diet and food, like, um, oh gosh, I need notes. Uh, <laughs> Hippocrates and, and Galen is who I'm thinking of. Hippocrates, you may know, is the doctor fella who uh, makes all the doctors nowadays say that oath that begins mm -hmm. first do no harm. Uh, Galen was a fellow who came after Hippocrates, expanded on his ideas, and gave us things like the four humors. And uh, did, you did know, he dissect a pig as well? Was he the first one to yes to dissect the pig. pig and compare it to the human anatomy? Good catch. Yes, he was. So yeah, I mean, sometimes I wish I could be a scholar in the real old days because you know you just do anything really yeah. <laughs> and you're just like oh, i'm fabulous and everybody goes yes he is yes, she is give her whatever <laughs> she wants <laughs> no mm. whereas now we have to work quite hard to justify what we're doing and why <laughs> you, yeah you have to prove it you can't just yeah. convince be, be a very convincing person and just kind of get by yeah, there's no sitting in a bathtub and, and may having an epiphany and screaming eureka and running naked down the hall anymore and i just <sighs> why not I think there mm -hmm. should be. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> next next time you have a bath, you can if when something just comes into yes. your head, you can You're on. you can pretend. You okay. <laughs> you can pretend the rune cattle wealth thing is yours. Yes. <laughs> and then you can get your get your husband at the end of the hall with his phone waiting <laughs> filming and you can shout Eureka. You gra obviously grab your towel first. <laughs> we we we're going on Instagram with this and then just run down the hall. And you'd be like, I've, I've done it. I've done it. I mean, I'm, I'm sold. That's that's going in my defense slideshow. I mean, well, <laughs> what else do you want in life? <laughs> I mean, there you go. Absolutely. That's fab. <laughs> but what were we talking about? Diet. <laughs> we were at diet. We were, you were at so, Foxy's and Galen. <laughs> Yes, indeed. So uh, by even in the Middle Ages, when we were supposedly, you know, over the Roman Empire, everything was quite shaped by these ideas still because of, you know, the longevity and the reach of, of their work. And so we we had ideas about, you know, the four humors guiding our bodily health all the way up till the 1800s. It was pretty ridiculous mm -hmm. by modern standards. I'm not judging these people, of course. They were doing their best. When you when you said four humors, for humors is that uh -huh. is that like good bile is it is it like black it's, bile uh, black bile yellow bile blood and blood and kiss? phlegm okay phlegm is the other one yes phlegm. so you know as time goes along uh people like galen and others who came after him and were fascinated by these ideas they would add so they would say things like um in order to have balanced health you have to eat you have to have balanced dishes uh, so, you know, if you're having, um, for example, they categorized rabbit as wet and cold for some reason. So you had to eat it with a vegetable that was uh, warm and hot <laughs> or okay. dry and hot. Yes. So so the dish would be properly balanced. And, you know, that's why a lot of things in the, you know, ye olde medieval cookbooks are sort of horrifying by modern standards. It's because they were they were looking at it through a lens that we no longer really use. They were looking mm -hmm. at it with an eye to this idea of balancing their humors uh, that we just we just go for what tastes good. <laughs> so yeah. how much how much focus was there on taste? Because obviously for us now, it's all about taste. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I would say, you know, you wanted to make make it a certain amount of tasty so that people would eat it but it really was not the focus okay and especially in a resource poor area like iceland um you know you might have skier three meals a day if you were a, a poorer farmer and that was just it so whatever you could do to make it more palatable good on you pally but it really wasn't the focus um if you could find some berries to put in your skier um here in iceland we still have it with like cream and berries on christmas uh, all these kinds of little things that you can do to make it more palatable because um, MS 
to answer your earlier question, I got so carried away. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> to answer your earlier question, how much is the current stuff like the old days, the medieval times? Um, uh, MS does have a brand. They have two different heritage brands, really. There's the one they export to the world. And that one's called uh, Ise. Uh, uh, that one is sort of modern and, and sugary and delicious. They have flavors like creme brulee and things like that, that, of mm -hmm. course, they couldn't have dreamed of in the medieval period. Uh, but then also uh, they have a brand called Kea which is a, a more um, a more traditional brand. It still has sugar, but not as much. Uh, the flavor is, is, a, is a bit more uh, traditional, which is a bit sour. It's another reason why people tend not to like skier or to prefer Greek yogurt because it is sour. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, the, these kinds of distinctions can come up. And I've, I've talked to the people from MS and I'm like, what is your thinking with these two brands? And they're like, well, we came up with Kea because, you know, the, the older generation of Icelanders wouldn't eat, you know, this newfangled creme brulee flavored stuff. So <laughs> they wanted skier like their grandmother yeah. used to make. And it's just like, oh, OK, OK. And yeah. that's, of course, that's another huge element of food history. It's, you know, how did your grandmother make it and why and what does it mean? All those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. OK, I'm going to bring Sorry. the tone. I'm going to bring we're the tone. Of, we're going bring... all kinds of places. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the tone down a little bit because I don't know if you've ever been to York or the Jorvik Viking Center. I have not, but I know okay. I know the know general where... idea of what went on. <laughs> okay, maybe you know where I'm going with this. Because they found something very interesting. And it was like a really big poo. Um and it's big. Oh, yeah, I've seen the picture. Wow. It's, it's fucking big. Impressive. <laughs> uh, the, the the gentleman or lady who, who laid <laughs> that, okay, was I not eating skier. Gender balance. <laughs> they, they I really went, want to think that that was a man's word, personally. Okay. But <laughs> I mean... Well done. They, which, I, you know, I'm being, gen, I'm being neutral here. I, I don't know. So, but whoever laid that, was not eating skier for three meals a day. That's an, that's not a three skier <laughs> three skier meal kind of shit. That so indeed, aren't we so lucky? Yes, this is what I think. Because every so often, people will send me like things from the internet that they think will be fun for my research. So I get a lot of cheese memes, but I do occasionally get this. <laughs> This fabulous poo, which, oh my God, for those of you guys who have not experienced it, it is like a baby's arm. It's just, it's not to be underestimated. To, um, to say how long it's been, because that thing must have dried up and shriveled over the, the past thousand years. So I actually had not thought of that. Fantastic. So, so when that thing came out, like, this, you know, <laughs> I... Indeed, yeah. He, um, We're going to get a picture of it and add it in post. Yes, it's it's really something. <laughs> More people should suffer the way that I have. But yes, what what this this magnificent artifact uh, did? <laughs> bless the archaeologists who uncovered it. By the way, <laughs> oh, I know they must have thought it was like a branch or something. And they were like, "Oh, I found a good reason not to be an archaeologist." <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Um, but yes, it is wonderful that these things are preserved because they do tell us a lot about diet. It does add, uh, how should we say, the back end to the story. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, as I said, I study, you know, culture and how we're eating and what we're eating. And then, of course, um, these kinds of finds tell us a lot about how all that goes into the body <laughs> and is affected. But th um, well, that's that's what I was going to say on you know on a serious and obviously it is a it is a funny topic especially the size of it just makes it funny. Oh my god, massive! <laughs> but, but like there, it must have been for somebody like you and for archaeology, it, it must have been a a gold mine really. And, and as crazy as it sounds, for for what we can learn about what they ate, what they ate, and the diet, you must have yeah. really wanted to dig into it. 
is absolutely a gold mine um, and a reason to question all your life choices. But <laughs> we are very happy it exists. Um, it did show us, for example, one of the main finds uh, after chemically analyzing this <laughs> thing. <laughs> Uh, that, you know, we can extrapolate and say that many, if not most, medieval people were infected with parasites based on oh. these kinds of findings. You know, they they didn't have the full understanding of, of, you know, the importance of temperature, cooking at the correct temperature, cooking for the right amount of time. Oh, God, I'm so sorry, Emily. <laughs> bon appetit! <laughs> oh. And... Uh, <laughs> And things like this. So, and, you know, often if they were out in the wild traveling, they might have, you know, eaten something contaminated and not had any way of knowing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was just a reality of life for them. But yes, uh, your earlier mentioned that this was not a skier guy. He was, he had a very meaty diet, yeah. this, this person. Or but, she. Don't, or she. You're not putting that, you, you're not putting this on us. I would really. <laughs> Good. I just wow! This one, I I'm picturing like a massive person who is uh, responsible for this. Oh yeah, artifact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it would have had to be like a real Brunhilde. Let's just say mm -hmm. <laughs> who set this one down. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, let's just say that. Um, so yes, she would have had uh, meat, and in most medieval cultures, uh, Germanic, uh, Scandinavian uh, meat is indicative of an elite person's diet. Um, not the case in Iceland, though, because we uh, we don't get uh, we have a lot more problems with survival here. We have almost no native um, animals as well, only the Arctic fox and a few uh, reindeer. So all of our stock has to be very carefully watched. And it is still carefully watched to this day. Iceland doesn't uh, vaccinate any of its farm animals and they keep them very closed off. You're not allowed to import any animals they're all a native breed descended from that original stock that was brought over by the first settlers and then the reason for that is um one because it is a, a heritage breed but also uh two they did try to supplement both the icelandic horse which is its own breed descended from mongolian steppe horses if i'm not mistaken okay and the um icelandic sheep which is its own breed um they did try to supplement these two during the 1800s and unfortunately the animals that they imported had a very common um health issue called scab um uh, which uh, you know the hardier farm animals can handle with proper treatment but here in iceland they had no experience with scab and so we lost something like 40 percent of of the stock of in the whole country and this was, you know, on top of uh, the Lackey eruption, which happened earlier in the century in the, in the late 1700s. The Lackey eruption uh, was a volcano that erupted here, which would have been bad enough for the landscape. But in erupting, it, it released, you know, hundreds and hundreds of tons of uh, poisonous gas, which then uh, killed quite a lot of people and livestock. At that time, 60% of all the livestock in Iceland died. So, you know, these sorts of things kept happening and happening throughout history. And so we've become very protective of our livestock as well. I, I teach a class every fall that's, um, you know, the history of Iceland from settlement to today. And it, basically, I'm, you know, going along through the events of Icelandic history and it's all fine. And then I say, and then it got worse because there'll be a, a plague or a pandemic or a, or a, an eruption or something. And then my students always turn to me and say, why? Do people live here? And I say, I don't know, you guys. We don't know why, but we love it. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so it, it's a good point. Yeah. It is a good point because I can see, obviously now I can see why people live there because you have a, an infrastructure that's built. Yes. And now it's a bit easier. <laughs> you have heating and you have hot water mm -hmm. and it's all comes from natural sources. It's, it's brilliant. 
but it wasn't always like that. Oh no, we had regular hobbit holes and turf houses. And yeah, we made, it sucked. We made vats of skier at every farmhouse that were, you know, feet across yeah. uh, in size. So we just had lots and lots of skier. And we know that they were very, very large, the skier vats at every farmhouse, because we have an account in Heimskringla, which is one of our sagas, of a, a man named Geyser, who was a famous Icelandic Godi chieftain and politician. And he was trying to escape uh, some of his political enemies who had come to kill him in the night. He was tipped off and he ran into the, uh, the dairy on his farm to hide. And he said, fuck it, I'm gonna hide in the skier. So he jumps in the skier vat and Geyser himself is described as a very tall man. You can imagine after generations of eating all of this butter and skier and cheese, we had lots of calcium in our bones. And mm -hmm. so <laughs> very tall, that's probably part of the reason literally yeah. why the Vikings were very tall and strapping. Um, and so he hides in the skier and it covers him all up. <laughs> and so his- I feel, like, I feel like there's a kink out there for that somewhere. Yes. Yes, it's absolutely there absolutely is. is. It's a cartoon moment, but I love it. <laughs> so his uh, political enemies come into the dairy and they're looking around for him and they think maybe he's in the skier. So they take their spears and they poke the spear, the skier, but they don't find him. So they leave thinking he's run out into the night. And uh, Geyser stands up having thwarted his enemies, of course. But then, of course, he's covered in skier in Iceland in the winter. So he almost freezes to death, but he manages to make it to a church and declare sanctuary uh, and then get himself warmed up. So he escapes his enemies that time because of skier. <laughs> what, an, what an interesting story. I mean, it worked. He was like the magician's apprentice in the box and he was just <laughs> twisting her around the spears. Indeed. But yeah, like you say, it, it shows obviously the size of the vat that if you mm -hmm. can hide in there and yeah and not be... so this is what we we have to do when we're uh dealing with something that's really abstract we just sort of have to look at all the evidence and really think about it in as many ways as we can and uh and see what we can come up with and sort of yeah. extrapolate from what these uh, literary sources tell us and add in some archaeology if we can find it mm -hmm. and you know the world's largest poo uh yeah <laughs> Yeah. Things like this that just add to the story and add to the story. <laughs> okay. So to, to try pull us back on some sort of track, obviously you specialize in, in Iceland. So what mm -hmm. would be the the average Joe diet? Because it can't be just skier, surely, because that no, surely no, no. You couldn't survive just on that. So so what would the, the average diet be? And, and again, I guess, would it be different from summer to winter? Um, yes, it would. Um, there's a couple of things going on. Um, there were always, of course, holidays. Um, there's something like 180 holidays in the Icelandic calendar. And again, there's another example of how we know dairy products were so important because it's written into the law of Iceland in Graugaus that Icelanders are allowed to see to their, their animals and the women are allowed to see to the milking even on holy days which if any of you guys in here study religious matters, you know the church was very no, no, no about working on Sundays. That was the Lord's Day. You were supposed to be thinking about pious things. Yeah. Um, but they had to make that provision here because if they didn't, then uh, you know the people wouldn't survive. They needed to be able to make sure that their animals were healthy. And part of that includes milking them regularly. You can't just put your feet up because God says so. <laughs> um, Yes. So all of that's very important. What was your question again? <laughs> Sorry. What would, what would be the diet for the average? The diet for Ice, the average. Let's, let's just say the so, run of the mill Icelandic farmer. Nothing, nothing special. Yes, you know. indeed. I remember what I was going to say. He's got, he's got, <laughs> he's got, he's got, a, he's got his <laughs> wife and the mm -hmm. three, four kids. And, you know, they're just having a very pleasant life. So, yes, they would have uh, bread, of course, give us this day our daily bread. It's the foundation of every culture everywhere, some form of bread. In Iceland, that would be a rye bread or a barley bread because you couldn't grow wheat here. The ground was just not hospitable enough. Um, and so brown breads are more common in Iceland, definitely, but also popular in other parts of Northern Europe. Oh, it, seems uh, to be, then, it seems to be huge in um all of Scandinavia yes. compared to certainly compared to like England 
you know, we love our sugary white bread. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. we love and, it. And that's because you guys have all that beautiful farmland and that good soil to grow wheat with. Mm-hmm. We we had a medieval warming period here when we first arrived and then it ended. It petered out about uh, 1250 and then things cooled off a bit and you couldn't grow a fart here in Iceland. It was all about, you know, the minimum you could do uh, was to grow fodder for your livestock. And so that's really the only thing we grew after that. It was all about the livestock. So you would have a little barley for your bread. Um, you'd have butter and cheese to go with that. Um, if it was a holy day, uh, you might be, depending on what kind of holy day, of course, because some days restricted dairy. They actually, in one of those cookbooks I mentioned earlier, they had a recipe uh, that was popular in Denmark for a kind of ski that was made with almonds. So you could eat it on the holy days. And what that kind of um, allowance tells us is that, you know, having this kind of stuff was so important that uh, they really couldn't imagine their meals without it. So in order to assuage the needs of the church and obey those rules, they made sort of a faux skier for those days out of almonds. So, um, so, so, so what's the reason that they can't eat dairy on, on a holiday? Oh, uh, actually, that's a good question. I am not a church scholar, so I am not 100% sure why uh, it was uh, forbidden. Um does anybody know? Kind of like yogurt with Indian food. Yes, indeed. Him is on this topic like white on rice. <laughs> She's amazing. Yes. Um, but I'm not sure why exactly the church had such a, an issue with it. But but it just was a thing. It was that. But it was definitely a thing. It was very okay. strict. It was um, even all the way up until Vatican II in the modern era in the 1960s. You know, the the Pope told all of his followers around the world, you know, you can't eat fish on Fridays. But or you must eat fish on Friday. Sorry. <laughs> but that one, of course, went away. So these things do change. And at the time, it was part of the belief system to not eat uh, dairy on on uh, holy days. Uh, for Kim K, the church question was, you know, do do I know why uh, dairy products were sometimes forbidden on certain holy days? And I do not. Uh, I do know, though, for example, uh, as far as dairy and the church goes, um, uh, this go- and this goes all the way back to the um, ancient world, ancient Rome and the Mediterranean triad, which is the foundation of their diet. Mediterranean triad is wheat for bread, uh, olives and olive oil, and grapes for wine. So any of you guys who are drinking wine with us right now, you're very Mediterranean, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Uh, so this became sort of the standard triad of all civilized diets. Everyone else who didn't eat like this was a barbarian. And we see this on lots and lots of writings by guys like Tacitus and Jordanus when they venture out of the Roman Empire and go see, you know, different tribes that are hanging about on the outskirts. You know, these are the tribes in in places like the UK and in places like... uh, Iceland, uh, there was no way we could grow grapes. And because we were so far away, it it was incredibly expensive to import it. Uh, so there were things like weird things that we were doing, like instead of having wine for the communion cup, we'd put milk in it. And then the church went, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> That's terribly barbaric of you. Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, we had people like Bouchard de Worms all the way back in the ninth century at the, uh, in his writings of the Ducreta, he said, you know, there are these barbarians who are doing horrible things like putting milk in the communion cup and we can't stand for it. And, you know, the women there, they, they perform uh, all kinds of um, magical spells with milk and they, all these kinds of things. He was really worried about the ladies, Burchard was. <laughs> okay. But on all of these things, and you know, women are associated with milk because they do the milking of the animals and things like this. So, you know, it all it all just comes together in a really strange mix of prejudices and, and strange rules for behavior and all this sort of stuff. It's really quite interesting. Let's see, how far was I in the original question? What do you eat? Milk, cheese, bread, okay. Milk, cheese, and bread. It seems, yeah. it seems a very dairy heavy diet. Very dairy heavy, absolutely. Um, you would also have fish, of course. Fish was um, 
abundant in a um, in an island like Iceland. Um, but there was also an attitude, sort of a, a philosophical awareness at this time, which also comes to us from Rome in the ancient world, that in order to be civilized, in order to not be a barbarian like Tacitus and those guys were always grumbling about that you had to be you had to behave in a certain way you had to carve out civilization by creating agrarianism creating farmland from this chaotic um unknowable nature which they called saltus you know saltus they don't know what's out there it's, it can be all sorts of scary things it can be monsters in the woods um, so you have to create boundaries with your own world. The, the fences that, that surround your farm, for example, they bound your civilization. And inside it is everything that is safe and good to eat. Inside it are your fields and your animals and your home and your wife and your children. And that is civilization. So um, around, let's see, what was it in Iceland? Definitely around 1800, because they'd gone through the plague, the Black Plague of Europe, and they'd gone through the eruption of Laki and several other things. You know, the whole system had broken down in Iceland. And so, you know, many of the livestock were gone. And so people had to go to the coasts. There was this mass migration of people in Iceland toward the coasts because now they had to abandon their idea of being proper civilized farmers they had to go back to in a sense living off the land taking directly from nature which is fishing mm -hmm. and then we had the fishing boom thank god for the herring and the cod because they allowed us to bridge that gap between the lucky eruption which was so devastating and um the modern era where we could finally get food imports from other countries reliably <laughs> So, yes, it was absolutely all of that. So dried fish is another thing that's quite weird in Iceland specifically. Mm -hmm. Instead, of, if you don't have bread, you put butter on your dried fish. Like that's oh. that's just how it is. And some people, especially tourists who come, they're like, what? <laughs> and it's you have to think about it. Like, why would they butter their dried fish? That doesn't make any sense. Unless you realize that, you know, grain and such was hard going for a, quite a long time here and so they just they, you know they mimicked that idea of putting butter on something before you eat it by mm -hmm. creating this uh other dish which is known as harfiskur <laughs> and they sell it now in the modern grocery stores little shrink wrapped dry fish and you get a little pat of butter on the side <laughs> oh. it's great <laughs> oh that's nice yeah okay. so we have milk cheese Butter, fish, fish. Butter, and bread. of course, the, the final stop for any of your livestock, if they're mean, if they've stopped giving milk, if something else is going on, if it's a feast day and you need a good sacrifice, if, you know, one of your fighting horses has got injured because uh, fighting horses was a thing in Germanic cultures, <laughs> um, then you might have to say goodbye to him and put him on the dinner table instead. Mm -hmm. Um and so uh, in that sense, uh, if you were very wealthy and you could afford to lose your animals, then you might be eating more meat. Or if you'd got to a point where you needed to slaughter your animals in order to keep food on the table, you might be eating more meat at that point. So meat but would be more of kind of few and far between, whether it's a special occasion or when the situation is... The situation arises where you had to call an animal. It wouldn't be a necessity because we all know that we all know somebody in our lives probably who is like, I have to have meat for every meal. It has yes. to be, and if there's not meat on my fucking plate, then it's not a meal. Oh yeah, yeah we all know. My that. husband is one of these. You know, if there's no meat in it and there's no potatoes, then what are we even doing here? You know, yeah. very that. So I completely sympathize, but absolutely, that's a very modern idea. Um, that didn't really become a thing until the 1900s to have okay. meat three meals a day. In fact, yeah. breakfast is also a modern invention. We we normally slept later and we didn't have our first meal until about 11 after, okay. you know, the morning chores were done. And then you'd sit down and scarf. Uh, you know, these kinds of things, they came... They came through a variety of um, just social changes, economic changes. Um, breakfast in the United States, for example, was extremely popularized when cornflakes were invented. 
because there was a fella, uh, Mr. Kellogg, the guy who invented the flakes. He <laughs> he had this whole like mantra and theory of the way you should live your life, and you should start your day with something you know bland, so you didn't upset your stomach, your tummy. He was sort of throwing back to the four humors, uh, but yes, that was his theory. And but everyone throws sugar on it anyway. Everybody throws sugar on it now. You know, Kellogg would be stunned, shocked. Uh, and, and of course, before that, there was uh, the Industrial Revolution, which meant uh, people were l- working a lot more, longer hours at a factory. And so they would need, you know, quick food to get them through the day. Um, you know, that's this is when all of our troubles started in the modern era of, you know, not always being able to sit down and enjoy a meal, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so it all goes back to these kinds of changes and it's, I love it. It's fascinating. Um, okay. So what about <laughs> what, what about vegetables? Veggies? Well, it depends on where you grow, you're grow. you going or where you're talking about, of course. Um, other places, again, had much more variety. Um, places like Norway and Denmark, for example, to compare, uh, they were able to stop relying on skier quite so much much sooner, as I as I mentioned before, because they had other options. Uh, Iceland doesn't have much for veg. Uh, we have some, some cabbage, we have some rhubarb, we have some potatoes. Potatoes are our big one. Okay. So it's just potatoes and fish every day uh, from the 1900s on, really. I mean, it's a um, healthy diet. It's healthy. Yeah, it's just not so bad. <laughs> so... Um, I'm going to have to ask you about like the fermented fish, but I'm going to tie that into, I guess if, you know, if you're going to cull an animal, whether it's you catch a shark or you have to kill one of your cows or sheep, you know, there's, there's a lot of meat on that. You're not going to want to eat it all in one sitting. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the method of preserving the meat, obviously one of them being the fermented, the fermenting, how would you do that with, the, the meat with the, the sheep, the cow, the, the goat? Well, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Um, and another one, is, uh, and there's one that's made possible because of all the skier. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking skier. I never expected it to be this to be a skier heavy episode. I didn't mean episode. to go there again, but it just seems like we keep going around. Okay. I, but if so, it's, it, it, I, I, I guess I was going to ask you kind of, uh-huh. what what's the most important food in like Oops, the Viking sorry. Age, or at least like in, in particular in Iceland, and I guess the answer is always going to be skier. So I don't even have to ask yeah, that baby. question anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's either the skier, uh, or you know the dairy product, the butter, the cheese, or it's the fish. Okay. No, no question. It just depends on which period. Earlier period, it's definitely skier. Later periods, definitely fish. Okay. Um, okay. Back to preservatives. Preservatives. Okay, well, we were using some really nice, like basically Stone Age methods of preserving food, which is one, drying, and that's how we get our dried fish. Uh, We generally just hang it up and, um, uh, you know, wait for nature to do its thing. Um, (laughs) Not not a whole lot of skill or, you know, necessity involved in that one. What stops it going off? Why why doesn't it just go off? How, How do you dry fish? Right. Well, see, this is the thing that that a lot of people don't understand. And you might have seen like the memes that go around uh, the Internet every once in a while where somebody will save like a McDonald's hamburger and they'll be like, I saved this five years ago and you can see there's no mold on it. What's in this food? Yeah. Okay. And it's like if you keep it moist and at a, or, no, not moist. If you keep it dry and at a, at a regular you know temperature. That is what happens. That's essentially a dried hamburger that you're looking at there, Dan. <laughs> okay. Um, because, you know, you know, bacteria and mold and all those kinds of fun things that happen to food that people are expecting when they look at these little meme pictures, um, they got to have certain conditions. They got to have warmth and they got to have wetness. And if, you, if you're just keeping it like inside on a counter so you can take a picture of it every now and again, it's not really meeting those qualities. So the same is true of um, the fish. You just hang it up, make sure it's not getting wet. So, you know, it'll be done in a barn or a shed or something to keep the rain off. And it should be fine. Nature will just do its thing. Um, (laughs) The other (laughs) 
the other way of doing things is gross and it's called molding um oh so the, it sounds the opposite yes <laughs> that is where you deliberately want a a, a sort of a a barrier of mold to go around on the top of your meat to keep, you know, rot from happening. So okay. before you eat it, you have to scrape off the uh, the stuff, the the mold kind of thing. It's it sounds really gross to think of doing this with meat, but it's the same idea of a good like white cheese where it has the mold on the outside. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're okay with that kind of mold. <laughs> yeah. So just think of it in those terms and less about green fuzzy meat. <laughs> no, I, it's just not so appetizing. No, I, then, I, I get it. It makes sense. <laughs> yes, like salamis and things like this. But and would then, they, uh, sorry, just to oh, kind of jump in, how, how much understanding would they have had not to eat the mold? Well, uh, a fair amount of understanding, I would say, because, you know, if you aren't careful about what you eat, you die real quick. So, and that was, of course, a reality that they were very close to. You know, the yeah. average person would have seen someone get sick and die from eating the wrong food or or even not even die, but just maybe get very sick from eating the wrong food. Um, so this is why, you know, throughout the medieval period, the mushrooms were very much given side eye, for example, because mushrooms are tasty and they're a cool veg, but also they didn't have a wealth of knowledge about them. And also a lot of mushrooms look very similar and some are poisonous and some are not. So, you know, in general, in the medieval period, people would avoid mushrooms because they couldn't be sure. See what I mean? I, I still avoid mushrooms. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> probably it might be a little bit of an evolutionary avoidance thing because, you know, we did avoid them for centuries. It's, it's the texture. It's all okay. about texture. Yeah, texture is mouthfeel. Mm. <laughs> but I, I am fascinated about this idea of the, is everything we eat must must have been tested by somebody. You know, there's a lot of berries you can't eat. And True. I'm fascinated by the idea of like that one person who like you're out with your buddy and he eats a berry and then falls sick or shits Whoops. himself. <laughs> and, yeah. and then you're like, ah. Gary's dead. <laughs> Better not eat that one again. Everybody tell the tribe, don't eat those. <laughs> but but then I'm more, what fascinates me more is when we have something that's poisonous before it's cooked. Because which fucking psychopath saw somebody die when it was raw and then went, I know, let's warm it up. Yes. Let's and then they're okay. The mm -hmm. And how many, and I, at what point, how, how many people had to die like, until you got to the right temperature to know what you could, how warm you could make it. Exactly, it was it was very much trial and error back in the old days. Yeah, yeah, for sure, absolutely. And then, of course, everyone's most favorite food preservation method would be souring, which is the byproduct of all yes. that lovely, all that lovely skewer that we made. Uh, as I said, as I mentioned, uh, it's really compacted down, and all the whey is skimmed away. Whereas if you want like a yogurty thing, you stir some of the whey into the product. We took all the way, uh, we drain all the way off the top. It's that watery stuff that appears on top of your yogurt when you open the tin sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then we would, because you can't waste anything in an environment like this, we would take the whey, just called mesa in Icelandic, and we would, you know, have a bowl of it and then stick your uh, meat in it, you know, just to sit. <laughs> And <laughs> why did that sound so sexual to me then? I was just like, that sounds did. so as wrong. As soon as I said it and you started laughing, I was like, oh God, we've taken a turn. <laughs> I mean, there there are those people out there that would do that as well. That's that's the Don't thing. do that, guys. <laughs> guys or ladies or anyone who has an appendage because um <laughs> whey is very acidic. It's full of all that lactic acid oh. that <laughs> would have gone into the cheese. Um, so that's why it preserves. It's all about the lactic acid at that point. And it stops any bacteria from growing uh, on, on the food that you're trying to preserve. So would you would you leave it in the skier or in the way, sorry? Um, Generally, uh, yeah. You'd, you'd either leave it in the skier or you'd soak it enough that it would soak into the skin, you know, for a certain amount of time. 
-hmm. And then it would be, um, and then it would be, uh, you know, resistant on its own and you didn't have to leave it in the liquid. Okay. Because it would sort of have a skin, a skin on the outside. Um, yeah. another I, way assume that, it must, I, I assume it must change the flavor a little bit. Oh, yeah. Things get sort of sour and sort of samey tasting. Everything tastes like well, a, little, a little bit like Fucking that fabulous skier. cowcatch. Yeah. It sounds what like it would get in the way a bit. Oh, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> way, W-A-G-Y. Oh. We, we have a funny, funny little audience. Um, okay. What would... What about salting? Is that a is that a thing? Salting is a thing, yes. But we didn't really get uh, reliable sources of salt here in Iceland until uh, late 1500s, early 1600s, when we started importing it from France. Um, we did have one salt making facility. It was in the north, and they made black salt because that is the kind that you get here. <laughs> We're a volcanic it's, island, so everything the pieces is. are black. Everything's black. Um, one thing that's really interesting to know is that as far as salting goes, as soon as salt was reliably available, we started to salt the crap out of our butter to preserve it. So uh, butter was also extremely uh, valuable in the later period as well. You could pay your rent uh, with butter. <laughs> so they would wrap it in fish skin and mm -hmm. salt the crap out of it, and then it would be kept for years. Wow. And then, okay. um, for example, one of our, we have two bishoprics here. We have Holar in the north and Skalholt in the south. And the bishopric at Holar, uh, they did an inventory of all of their stores around the time of the Reformation in the 1500s. And they discovered that Holar was sitting on a frigging mountain of butter. They were sitting on 25 tons of salted butter. <laughs> so yeah that's, that's a fucking lot of butter that's a lot of butter baby for sure were they just eating sticks of butter <laughs> i'm starting to think maybe it was like those really stupid recipe gifts things where they just like people just take you know three sticks of butter and then fry something in it and then drink the butter have you ever seen those yeah. oh. <laughs> what Absolutely. are you thinking maybe it was a little bit like that though mm. <laughs> they definitely had enough to do whatever they wanted to let's just say yeah. that <laughs> okay so so the mention uh, the, the mention of salt got me thinking of another question and that's what about flavoring of food because obviously you know this one thing just cooking your sheep steak your lamb chop is this sure. sheep steak no lamb chop sheep piece of meat is it cost <laughs> of steak i don't know whatever it is your let's just say your typical cow steak <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> let's just go with that <laughs> <laughs> let's just go with okay you know it's one thing just kind of cooking this food as it is just to eat it and it's going to taste right. it's going to taste as it's meant to taste and certainly uh -huh. without the without the addition of salt it's going to be quite bland certainly to our palate today so were they you know spices things like that is that um when does that get far, introduced as far as a great variety of spices they wouldn't have been available to most of the population only the more wealthy people who could afford to import mm-hmm the same for wine. Wine was very difficult to get. And we can see that in things like the characterization of Odin in the Eddas. He only drinks wine. He gives his food to Geren Freke, his wolves that sit at his feet. Mm -hmm. And he only speaks in poetry. You know, he's a he's an awesome drunk uncle at a party. But there is a reason he only drinks wine. He is the old father, after all. And so he's meant to be seen as an elite and so elites drink wine, period. Okay. Um, so, yeah, things like that come through in the readings all the time. And, um, but yes, what was your question? <laughs> Spices. Sorry, Spices. Spices. Thank you. We do have some native oh, food, spices. Food, food flavor, not necessarily just. We do just, have but... some native spices here in Iceland. And, I, of course, they'd be more abundant in places like Norway and uh, Denmark because they are at a lower uh, a more southerly biome, they get more sun, they have a longer growing period there. Uh, here in Iceland, we have things like Angelica, 
And we have things like cumin, which we make brennevin out of, <laughs> mm -hmm. which we ferment the crap out of and make the world's worst liquor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, I'm not a fan of most of the native Icelandic food things because yeah. it, it it is so obvious that it was a struggle to live here <laughs> for a long time. I mean, we use haukadl basically to gross out the tourists. Mm -hmm. Alcatel is that famous fermented shark stuff yeah. for those of you guys who have not experienced it. It's very pungent. Um, we've had tourists, for example, who tried to take samples home of Haukar and uh, they cleared their plane, uh, for example, because the smell was just so ungodly strong <laughs> and the plane refused to take off until it had been aired out, things like that. Um, but yeah, so there were some spices uh salt as well but it for before the imports from france it would have been poorer quality salt um now of course it's wonderful we have things like birch salt which i love i put it on everything um gorgeous smoked salt mm -hmm. um we do have sea salt in an abundance so there is that I'm trying to think of other native native things we do have um berries here which occur naturally which are often dried and things like that so we did have our own unique flavors but i think again probably a french or italian uh food historian would be disappointed <laughs> <laughs> for sure what about what about from sort of sweden norway and the silk road you know, obviously they have access to the Silk Road into the Far East and India. Are there many spices coming from there? Do we know? Or is that kind of... Not until the later period. Okay. Um, it would have been possible because, uh, you know, Icelanders and Norsemen in general, Danes, everyone traded far and wide. Um, Icelanders traded as far as Constantinople, but it wouldn't have been... Well, I shouldn't say, because I'm not an expert in this one. I'm not a, an expert on Vikings of the East. Um, but uh, I would say probably the imports weren't regular and they probably weren't able to provide huge quantities, okay. you know, enough to enough to serve the entire uh, community. Yeah, it would just be maybe for the, the higher ups. Yeah, it would probably end up in the hands of those guys first. Again, ugh, they always get everything. <laughs> okay, before before we're gonna we'll finish on my experience of Harkal, which I had the, <laughs> Good the other times. Day. Um, but I want to ask you about so we spoke about like the everyday person, the everyday farmer. Sure. And then I wanted to wonder about like the higher ups, the Yarls, the kings. Because anybody who's watched any popular culture TV program of the Vikings, oh yes, <laughs> from the you know from the Viking Age, whether it's Vikings Last Kingdom, any well, any kind of TV or film on this subject, you always see the big halls. There's an abundance of meat, lit, like eating it off the off the bone and slamming the the beer and the meat around, and it's all Great. kind of very wasteful i think as well um yeah what how accurate is that what's that like well as far as one of those um i would say they're probably accurate uh for certain times it would be very common to see something like that at a feast a holy day celebration a holiday a wedding things like that um, but I did just teach a class on like the image of the Viking and modern reception theory. And we watched this stunningly goofy uh, movie from 1958 starring Kirk Douglas uh, called The Vikings. Uh, and it is very much what you're describing, you know, beardy men, you know, like, ah, yeah, covered mm. in beer, very like Conan the Barbarian, sort of ultra masculine fellers. Mm. And I, I think those images have stayed with us ever since pretty much that film, um, mm. which has shaped a lot of um, our idea of what a Viking is or what the Viking Age was like. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't say it's wrong, but I would probably... I would say that and those kinds of massive beery celebrations and stuff would be rare 
because there's a reason that Valhalla or Valhut to conjugate it properly is described as, you know, an endless um, thing, uh, an endless celebration of beer and ladies and, and fighting and good times with the men's and the women's uh, because those things were what everybody wanted, not what everybody right. had. If everybody had it, it wouldn't be like the most awesome of all possible afterlives in Norse mythology, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. I just, I just thought, how how much do you know of when it comes to like food within the mythology and the sagas? Because then I started thinking about that, about obviously like <laughs> the idea of is it a goat on top of Valhalla yes. that that has Adrian the meat? is the goat. Okay. So and she sits on top of Yggdrasil, the the world tree, and her teeth have created the uh, rivers of the world. And actually, my favorite piece of myth is that the primordial cow, Eithemla, is the one who starts all life on Earth. Uh, because as much as you are looking for a different answer, Bob, it's true. Milk or, or there is no life on Earth. Because without Eithemla, uh, then Ymir, the first primordial being, would have had nothing to survive on. Mm -hmm. He he drank from her udders and she nourished him it says in the Eddas and uh, and then from Ymir uh, all the parts of the world are created yes Ymir milked the first cow essentially so do you think that that comes from the, going back to earlier this, this idea that cows are so valuable they're so important they're the the high livestock so that would be why she would be the the, the life giver almost absolutely i i think you know a lot of people how should i say this a lot of people who don't spend hours and hours studying these things like uh i do <laughs> um it's easy to sort of dismiss like especially because the marvel movies are so much fun and we're seeing thor running around doing all kinds of goofy stuff and you're just like oh well these are stories well yes they are stories but why is the story told like this there must be something important in it. Um, a lot of, uh, and to sort of get away from my own focus, a lot of food historians believe that the story of Adam and Eve in the Christian Bible and the story of Cain and Abel uh, both tell, uh, they're basically metaphorical accounts of a shift from a nomadic life to an agrarian life. Because uh, if if you have heard this story, you know, Adam and Eve lived the life of plenty, you know, they were just taking from nature and whatever was given to them was fine and they were happy and life was good. And then, you know, a snake and an apple later and suddenly you know, their lives are filled with toil and the stony ground that they must now plow. And it's, it can be seen that this is a, a story about the change that came when we decided to stay in one spot stop moving around so much and grow things um, in our neat little fields and create those fences and, and make our own world in our own way. Uh, and Cain and Abel as well, because uh, Cain and Abel in the Christian Bible, one was a, one was a shepherd and one was a farmer and um, Abel's uh, offering to the Lord was a slaughtered sheep. And he, the Lord uh, liked his offering much better, which made Cain terribly angry and jealous and sad. And so he slew his brother. And so all of these kinds of things uh, are speaking to us when we are taking a look through a certain lens. <laughs> you have to be obsessed, Dan. That's what I'm really getting at. You have to be weird and obsessed and say all kinds of weird trivia at parties. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Let's I, be real. <laughs> no, I, I get that. I, I'm obsessed with my own things. Don't worry. I, I completely <laughs> understand what that's like. But okay, yeah. I'm I'm gonna get into to my experience of uh Hakal the, the <laughs> fermented shark and we'll finish on that. But before before we do, um you know, I'm sure there's gonna be a bunch of questions for you after the show. When we when we record our Q and A session with the with the patrons, and they, I've seen a bunch of questions already in there. We, we're keeping a note of them, so there's going to be a lot of questions for you. Okay. Um, I mean, 
and just for for anybody listening, sort of you know, listen to this. Who isn't a patron? If you can take a second just to pop over to Patreon forward slash Nordic Mythology Podcast, you can join the episodes live um, for three pound a month, or it's ten p a day. You get access to watch the shows live. You get a bonus episode every week, which is the Q and A, where you can listen back to the the answers and you know. Everybody always submits really good questions, so you can listen to that bonus episode on there. You can join live and and submit your question, or you can submit your question ahead of time when we release the the guest we're going to have on. There's a bunch of other bonus material we've got over there. Just just go and check out. We've got story time with Jonas Lorenzen. We've got you know discounts for Nordic Mythology podcast and Horns of Odin. So, so yeah, but just just go and have a look. It helps us helps us keep growing. It's the reason I managed to buy this snazzy new microphone you know it, it didn't come out of my pocket it came from the the money from the patrons everything that we get goes back into it whether it's through buying new equipment or paying for people to keep improving the show so if you can please go and have a look and if you can't then please just leave us a five-star rain positive review wherever you get your podcasts or just tell a friend and share the podcast with somebody that you think might be interested and or even as simple as leaving a comment somewhere. You know, it all helps. It all helps the algorithms out there, the the different little demons working behind Facebook and Instagram <laughs> that decide whether your posts do good or not. You know, it all helps. Um, so there, let's get into my experience. Oh. <laughs> so at, at the weekend, I, I guest appeared on a podcast called Will You Vike It? And it's a food-based, <laughs> it's a food-based uh, podcast and it's run by uh, Craig Brooks. And he's very much into his his food history. And he kindly brought some hack holes and fermented shark for me to try. And and the premise is that you sit down and you have a chat. So we we chatted a little bit about me and my my history, like with the podcast and the business I do. And then he has a, some questions that he asks you at the end. But there's also this part of it where you try either try some type of food that maybe he's cooked. Or like a traditional foodie might think that just to try and, and see engage your reaction. And then you would make something. So I made butter. So <laughs> I had, which I'd never done before. You know, nice. I had a I had a wooden bowl, um, some double cream, and didn't give me anything but my hand. Oh. So I didn't get I didn't get the <laughs> fancy, mean. I didn't get a I didn't get a churn. I got not to you know, I, I took all my all my jewelry off and just stirred the butter wow and okay. i was amazed how quick it actually turned into butter mm-hmm. i really yeah so i was very impressed by that and then he pulled out the stinky stuff because he saved the best for me <sighs> so <laughs> bless him he bought this stuff in from iceland especially for me i guess oh um, aren't you lucky <laughs> oh yeah and he pulled out this little tupperware box he'd been carrying around all week at the viking at the Jorvik viking festival and it's just this little airtight sealed box and i could see what was in it and as soon as he cracked because this thing had like four seals they're like well like four clamps to pull the (laughs) plastic seal on as soon as he popped like one and there's the tiniest gap i could fucking smell it yeah i could just she's pungent you guys oh oh my god (laughs) um and yeah and he took it off and i was like okay let me let me have a sniff of this. And I could not believe how much it smells of piss. Yeah, it's very, it's the reason it smells like that, everybody, is because the shark is an Arctic shark uh, that this is made from. And so in order to keep from freezing in the Arctic Ocean, the skin and organs of this creature are filled with urea which is sort of like a natural antifreeze, but it's also that the same chemical that's in urine, which is why it has that same name. Um, and so, yes, it's very unmistakable. Uh, oh, it is. Yeah, I, I just assumed it was like an ammonia or something. It was. Yes, absolutely. If you eat it raw, that's also why it will kill you. <laughs> so it has to be sort of buried for many moons and processed to make sure that it's safe to eat. And the fact that they. This is one of the things we were talking about this? earlier. This yeah, is the exactly. One, somebody ate that raw and died. And then they're like. Okay, well, what happens if we bury it and leave it for a month or so and then yeah. try it? 
let's do it again. It'll be fine, you guys. Like for real. Besides, we're out of food, so we need something to eat. Like, yeah, yeah. it's like, <laughs> go on, like, Dave. Oh, oh no. <laughs> this, do you think they they, they draw straws on who was going to try it? Because <laughs> I wouldn't want to be. I'd be like, I don't care if you fucking buried it for a month. I still don't want to eat it because Gary fucking died. Would you not? Yeah, I just maybe you can just tell me about it later. I don't. Uh... <laughs> yeah, you you try it. Yeah. let me know later just feedback <laughs> if you're all okay then yeah brilliant. we'll just see we'll keep an eye on you for a couple of hours and then maybe if we're hungry enough yeah well, the the traditional way to eat it to to not notice the taste so much is uh and the way they serve it for those of you who have not had this particular joy is they'll give you a little toothpick and uh, a little cube of halkar on a toothpick and so uh, and then they will give you a shot of brennevin, which is the traditional Icelandic schnapps made of mm-hmm. human, I think, or something very close in terms of okay. spices that does grow naturally here in Iceland. <laughs> so you're supposed to eat it, not taste it, swallow the alcohol, and just wash it away. And they both t- taste pretty bad, in my opinion, but the hot cuddle is definitely worse. This is this is really a, <laughs> a special moment <laughs> for anyone who comes yeah. to Iceland. Caraway, yeah. yes, thank you. Oh, it's caraway seed that um, um, this lovely brenda bean is made out of. Yeah. Okay. So obviously, me being me, I chose the biggest piece. <laughs> How bad? How bad can it be? You know, Don't make her go home, Dan. Yeah. How bad can it be? <laughs> got it. Got it on the end of the knife, and just. Oh yeah. Popped it in. <laughs> And yeah, I was doing okay, and I, it was because I, I was surprised. I guess I wasn't really surprised at how meaty it was because I kind of expected that. I, yeah. I expected it was going to be like a really chewy, meaty thing. Um, um but it was, it was so. I, it was like mm. a super strong mackerel to me, like a really strong. I could see that. Yeah, really, yeah. really strong fishy flavor. Yeah. And then obviously you just get in the, the tones of piss in there as well. <laughs> nice. Yeah, she's she's very special. <laughs> and I was doing okay. And then I, I started to feel my stomach going, so I just swallowed. Oh no. Okay, just, yeah. You don't don't drag it out, man. Yeah. Just I was like I was I was <laughs> chewing. I was chewing away. And then like my you know, like when you get something you don't really like and your face kind of just crumples up like you've eaten a lemon almost on one side. I was like, yeah. And I, yeah. yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah. I just need to I need to swallow this before I I change my mind and I don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's huh, it's for real. I, I had that, my... after after sorry, after I made the the butter, we had a little bit of butter pita bread and hackal little kebab. Oh, not not bad. I don't know if I'd be able to choke down more hop cartel after that, but <laughs> it it the butter and the pita bread helped. It did. It, it did does. help. It kind of just you know made it a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. For sure. <laughs> yeah, my first taste. We were at a little museum far in the north, and I had taken a trip with my husband's entire family for the first time. And we went to this little museum, which was great for tourist types. And um, it was a museum, it was like a maritime museum from a retired fisherman who had just sort of put all of his crap out in the back and called it a museum, which is lovely because that's just the spirit of Iceland right there. <laughs> oh, bless you. Um, <laughs> and he said, I have some hard cows that I've been uh, drying. Would you, would you like to try some? And everybody in Frothy's family looked at me. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I've heard about this stuff, but it can't be that bad, right? <laughs> so here he comes with his little toothpick and he hands it to me. And from these entire family is like arranged in a semicircle around me. And they're all just like, oh, oh he's going to do it. What's going to happen? <laughs> so I just swallowed it as quick as I could. And I was just like, huh? okay, well, this is an acquired taste, you guys. <laughs> it oh, is. man. Yeah, does, does I didn't get any Brennevin either. That stuff will put hair on your chest. <laughs> does anybody like, is anybody going out of their way to eat it? No. Other than okay. pretending. This is the thing. I complain about how cattle every once in a while on my Facebook, and I get a handful of Icelandic friends, at least, who will be like, actually, I like how cattle. Or I like to eat it when I'm getting a cold because then it will kill 
my will to live, but also like the germs in my throat and things like this. And I'm like, okay, but just get some Tylenol. You don't have to do that to yourself anymore, you guys. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. a very, very tough and manly thing, you know. You gotta, you gotta be ready. <laughs> oh, that's. I think that's um, a very popular thing on social media at the minute, though. No matter what you say, you could say the most heinous or horrible thing and somebody would be like yeah but i quite like it actually yeah <laughs> I say, no you fucking don't you're no, lying you don't, you don't. you're just saying it because you want to be cool and you're lies not cool everyone can exactly. see that you're just fucking lying you don't like it just be with the rest of us and say you don't like it for for sure yeah exactly okay perfect let's let's wrap this up we've got a bunch of questions for you over on the oh fantastic okay on the the q and a I've, I've seen some of them and they are yeah they're really interesting so like i said if you do want to check out that bonus episode and and hear us talk a little bit further going to depth on some of the patreon questions then pop over to patreon forward slash Nordic mythology podcast like i say it's three pound a month it's like buy me a cup of coffee a, a month and you get one episode extra every week plus another story time episode every month well worth it and there's a full back catalogue as well you can listen to. So it's, right. it's definitely it's definitely worth it. Um, Beth, where can people find you and read your lovely articles? <laughs> um, I have articles on medievalist.net. Uh, for example, if you search my name, quite a lot of them are there. I'm also on researchgate and academia.edu under my name, Beth Rogers. Um, and then, of course, I'm on Twitter. Uh which I cannot recall because I am silly. Hang on. Or on Facebook, just under my regular name, Beth Rogers there. Um, my Twitter is definitely something about his <laughs> historians. Let me see. Oh, I, I was hoping it was just going to be Beth Rogers. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. It's, it's at BLR Food History. So those are my initials, at BLR Food History. And so, so what is the the World War World War Food website? Oh, World War Food, yes, that's my website where I, you know, post my CV and things like that. You can see some of my funny uh, paper titles there. I do like a good pun. And you do. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like to just jazz up the boring old conference uh, brochures. <laughs> I'll say that, um, and you can see, you know, clips and bits, things about me uh there that's that's my website perfect oh uh, yeah that works okay and you can if you want to take a look for some reason into to my actual life you can follow me at daniel and scott Farrand one because some fucker still has daniel and scott Farrand, and i want it because he never posts and so everybody report him that's the worst okay i feel, I feel bad for saying that but if you want to report him Let's get rid of him. He yeah. never does anything. Just give me the fucking handle. <laughs> These are your people. Use them. <laughs> but yeah, you can you can see a little bit more into my life. It's usually just gym pictures and pictures of Rocco being cute. But what more do you need in life? I mean, we could go for a Rocco pick anytime. <laughs> yeah. He, oh, he's a he's a little sweetheart. I took a picture <laughs> of him today with my with my headphones on in front of the microphone, and he looks like he's getting ready to record a little podcast. So and cute. He's, he's adorable um and obviously you can follow the business at horns of odin follow the podcast just not mythology podcast whether it's on tiktok instagram facebook the facebook page you know you're going to find it all under that under that um under just the name of the podcast and again please leave a five star rating positive review it helps just bump us up the bump mm-hmm. us up the ratings it helps us get up and get discovered by new people. You know, it takes you maybe, I don't know, a couple of minutes to write a review, but it does help us just get discovered by new listeners every every week. And yeah. we're, you know, we're I'm having a lot of I'm having a lot of fun with this at the minute. And I'm trying to <laughs> hopefully get it out to to new listeners. It's it's a lot of fun. I enjoy doing it. And okay, I've been told that I have to plug Rocco's own Instagram. <laughs> which is just it's mr rocco <laughs> he does have his own instagram where where that with those kind of dog owners 
who can't help but make a little Instagram for their for their pet. But he has some sweet little pictures on there. So <laughs> give him a follow. It'll make him very happy because he completely 100% understands that he has an Instagram and he likes that when people double oh. tap double tap those little pictures, they make him very happy. <laughs> and he does write all the captions himself. Um, yeah, let's let's get out of here. Let's go do the Q and A. So, okay. thank you very much for everybody for listening. It was a lot of fun, for sure. <laughs>